December 30th, 2019, Dr. Li Wenliang, who worked at Wuhan Central Hospital in China, messaged his fellow physicians, alerting them to the appearance of a concerning cluster of pneumonia cases. In response, he was threatened and told to stay quiet. 39 days later, after becoming infected with the very virus he'd been warning about, he was dead at age 33. By that time, the disease had already spread to dozens of countries. His initial message read, seven cases of SARS confirmed at Hunan meat market. The latest on that, a new case confirmed right here in the US. Fifth case of the deadly new strain of coronavirus has been confirmed. Coronavirus, did it evolve in nature or was it man-made in a Chinese lab? I find it very hard to accept that one man in China eating a bat has absolutely caused this world scale of chaos and horror. Yeah, we know that the, the root of this is from, from animals. It comes from animals, like all the other things, like MERS and SARS. COVID-19 has underscored the urgency with which we need to end factory farming. And going vegan now has four strong pillars. We don't just have ethics, the environment and health. We now, of course, have infectious and not disease. Vegan mayonnaise, vegan meats, vegan cheeses, vegan milks. It's more than a tipping point. We've hit that. Now we're snowballing toward a cultural realization. Imagine a social media platform where every post helps people around the world live more sustainably, influence businesses, and give back to impactful causes without a dollar from your pocket. We're a billion. Our mission? To inspire a billion people to go vegan. Join us. Hi, I'm Klaus. For years, I've been making annual documentaries tracing the rise of the plant-based and vegan movement. But as we face the devastation that 2020 caused, the rise in consciousness this year has been unrivaled. The story starts in Australia in January. Wait, sir, file, it's location of your emergency. They're on the driveway, but there's a spot, there's fires broken out up close to the house. Oh, okay, sure, it's quite a long driveway, is it? Yes, very much so. And there's a car nearby, yep. um, and yes, so it's really close to the... You need to get your keys, get the car, get the car. Are you able to safely get out of the way? Um, I'm not sure. There are downright apocalyptic images coming out of Australia right the now. The 2,000 homes have been destroyed. It's a staggering toll on the nation's wildlife. Scorching more than 14 million acres of land. The WWF calls it one of the worst wildlife disasters in modern history. This isn't even air fire season. This is not air fire season. We lost whole animal cultures. It's pretty confronting. What we see in Australia now is something that's likely to be playing out all over the world for many, many years to come. It's never been more critical for us to understand what is driving this crisis. The Australian fires put the spotlight on the leading cause of climate change, animal agriculture which accounts for 14.5% of greenhouse gas emissions, more than all forms of transportation combined. Is the question we really need to be asking, should we just stop eating meat? Is that actually the answer? If we look at the wildfires in January in Australia, it's quite abstract for people to understand how that's related to eating meat, dairy and eggs. But meat, dairy and eggs are the leading cause of species extinction, habitat destruction, and are also one of the leading causes of greenhouse gas emissions, which of course heats up our planet and increases the likelihood and risk of wildfires. The Australian fires were so unprecedented in their scale, it begged the question, what can we do to minimise our impact on the planet? If food was part of the problem, it surely had to be part of the solution. That was the premise of Veganery, a campaign in January that not only saw hundreds of thousands of people try vegan diet, but also encouraged giants like KFC, Bret & Monge, Greggs, and others to bring new products to market. I came across this amazing page called We Are Veganuary, and I was like going through it, and literally so many restaurants and fast food chains have released like new vegan options for Veganuary. So I was like, let me go try them. There's an idea of 30-day 
vegan challenge that I, not only did it change my health, but it changed my wealth. Veganism was breaking growth and sales records all over the world. Even in 2019, 23% of all UK food launches were labelled vegan. And in 2020, the plant-based trend continued to gain massive popularity as politicians were left disgruntled. The most Australian of all activities is to be at the football and be eating meat pie and a beer or a cake. Now, to have a vegan pie, uh, I think we've got a problem here. The point is, animal products are beginning to lose popularity, with the meat industry all over the world facing issues. Even in China, swine flu resulted in the coal of 40% of the pigs in the country, leading to a shortage of pork. And as this happened, little did we realise that much worse was to come. I think that we've become very disconnected from the natural world. And many of us, what we're guilty of is an egocentric worldview, the belief that we're the center of the universe. We go into the natural world and we plunder it for its resources. We feel entitled to artificially inseminate a cow. And when she gives birth, we steal her baby. Even though her cries of anguish are unmistakable, and then we take her milk that's intended for a calf and we put it in our coffee and our cereal. And I think we fear the idea of personal change because we think that we have to sacrifice something to give something up. But human beings at our best are so inventive and creative and ingenious. And I think that when we use love and compassion as our guiding principles, we can create develop and implement systems of change that are beneficial to all sentient beings and to the environment. The day after Joaquin Phoenix delivered his prophet-like speech, the World Health Organization announced that the disease caused by the novel coronavirus, first identified in China, would be named COVID-19. Unwelcome but expected, the coronavirus has hit the UK. Outbreak aboard a cruise ship in Japan is getting worse, with more than 130 cases. The Philippines has reported the first death from the new coronavirus outside of China. At least six people have died in an outbreak of the new coronavirus, which has now reached the United States. I must level with you, level with the, the British public. More families, uh, many more families, are going to lose loved ones before their time. By the end of February, COVID-19 had cast its tentacles across the globe, with nearly 90,000 cases confirmed. <coughs> we are experiencing an unprecedented event, a global pandemic that in New Zealand, we have moved to fight by going hard and going early. As the numbers of cases and deaths mounted, the World Health Organization declared that COVID-19 could be characterized as a pandemic, with Europe at the epicenter. We have therefore made the assessment that COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. Societies around the world went into lockdown on an unprecedented scale, and of ensuing panic and economic turmoil, the blame game began. The Wuhan or the Chinese coronavirus. Xenophobia is also on the rise. A foreign virus. Discrimination of people based on race. It's going to come across to a lot of Americans as smacking of a xenophobia. They're looking for someone to blame. Many refuse to believe that such a highly infectious virus could have emerged from a wet market in China. I find it very hard to accept that one man in China eating a bat has actually caused this sort of world scale of chaos and horror. I, I find it very hard to believe, to be honest. And while the precise source of the novel coronavirus remains unclear, there was growing evidence that it had animal origins, being similar to coronaviruses typically found in bats. COVID-19 was believed to have started in bats, and we know that because the genetic sequence of the virus that infects people has been analysed. It's thought that it jumped from bats to an, what's called an intermediary species, and we think that's the pangolin. 
and then from pangolins to people. Now, both bats and pangolins were traded across what's called wet markets in China and also countries way beyond China too. And that's where basically animals are trussed up in cages, piled one on top of another in very close contact to each other, but also, of course, in very close contact with human beings. And so this is where zoonotic diseases, as they're called, normally start, is when you've got people in contact with wildlife that they would never normally be in contact with. Of the 51,000 media articles about COVID-19 published in the first month of lockdown, only 2.1% mentioned the word animal. This was surprising because the scientific community had been predicting a pandemic like COVID-19 for years due to the intensification of animal farming. Whether it was avian flu coming from factory farms, repeated bouts of swine flu from pig farms, MERS being the result of the way humans treated mammals, and SARS stemming from civet cats, scientists have been warning us for years that our treatment of animals is leading to an ever-growing number of outbreaks. In this age of emerging plagues, we now have billions of feathered and curly-tailed test tubes for viruses to incubate and mutate within billions more spins at pandemic roulette. Along with human culpability, though, comes hope. If changes in human behavior can cause new plagues, well then, changes in human behavior may prevent them in the future. The coronavirus, COVID-19, has been a major shock to the growth prospects of the global economy and the euro area economy. The pressures on the economy started being felt in every sector, including the meat and dairy industry. As restaurants in the hospitality sector shut down, demand dropped and slaughterhouses were forced to close. This morning, a growing number of major meat processing plants are closed. The world's biggest pork producer, Smithfield Foods, shut down its processing plant. Dairy farmers have been led to dump their milk. They're literally emptying it out right into the drain here, 25,000 gallons a day. The pandemic has exposed the dark underbelly of the meat and dairy industry, particularly slaughterhouses and what's happening inside slaughterhouses. So you had newspapers like the New York Times forced to do stories about the kill floor and show imagery of the meat processing because the slaughterhouses are hotspots of COVID-19 and tens of thousands of slaughterhouse workers have gotten infected. More than 200 have died. COVID-19 outbreak shone a whole new kind of spotlight on the meat industry. Articles were published from major outlets about pigs having to be drowned and suffocated and chickens being euthanized. For the first time ever, the public realized how fragile the animal industry was and the scale of suffering was magnified and visible to all. We put down sick pigs because you feel sorry for them. But have a healthy pig <laughs> to take a rifle and shoot it. It's unreal. Demand for meat and dairy products declined for the first time in nine years due to the coronavirus pandemic. 40% of Germans were cutting down on meat. And in the UK, over 50% of people were considering plant-based options according to a new poll. The dietary changes were so widespread that farming outlets began to spread propaganda as they worried about the growth of veganism and the ever apparent surge in plant-based meat sales. I think these stories make you become not necessarily a vegetarian, but to think twice about beef. And then you think twice about beef and then you try beyond, you kind of realize it's very, very similar. They're both protein sources. The new Beyond sausages are much better in terms of the kind of ingredients that we used to get. The price differential could be big. At last, Ethan Brown may have that price differential where he's cheaper coming under the beef complex. I think the, the way that COVID has changed people's diet inspired more people to try plant-based products and inspired people to really look into animal farming and consider how much they want to be involved and how much meat they want to eat. There was some interesting polling done during the year which showed that both in the UK and the US people were trying plant-based meats. Some of them simply couldn't find their normal products and polling showed that a huge number of them actually wanted to stick with it once they had tried it. We've seen the benefits of what's happened in the last month or two with the birds and the air and the cars, you know, being gone. Like we see what's happening, how much 
just that little difference of everything being quiet has made the earth mama earth is saying thank you right we feel that the global response to the pandemic showed that people were able to change their behavior for example there was a six percent drop in greenhouse gas emissions according to the un a decline of 90,000 barrels of oil per day according to the international energy agency and a dramatic decrease in nitrogen dioxide according to nasa as robert kunzig put it this does show us what's possible I just hope it motivates us to start adopting some of the more sustainable solutions. Imagine if we can shut down for this. What if we shut down just for a second and think about how to restructure everything? If everyone just uses plants as their medicine, as their food, their, their bodies will heal, the earth will heal, and we will no longer have these pandemics to worry about. We will no longer have a future to worry about. There were some polls that were looking at people's consumption of plant-based products. They said that in the UK, 20% of UK citizens were reducing their meat consumption, 15% were reducing their dairy and or egg consumption. In the US, you saw increasing sales of plant-based foods. And so I think what we've seen throughout 2020 is that people do take an acknowledgement of what's happening and will incrementally put changes into their life accordingly as well. I think awareness has grown around the plant-based lifestyle exponentially, and we're gonna see huge and rapid growth because the science and the data is there. Plant-based diet is better for the environment. It's better for human health. From an ethical perspective, it's profound. It's the only thing that seems to transcend all of these huge global issues that we face. If I want to measure my life by its impact on other species, and if I can make the ethical decision to not kill another creature to live, then I'll make that decision every single time. As more and more people spoke out about plant-based diets, this is fueled by increased awareness around the animal agriculture industry with factory farming being pinpointed as the single most risky behaviour for pandemics. It's not a coincidence that we talk about avian influenza and swine influenza. Those are the two species that are farmed intensively the most around the world. Thousands and thousands of animals packed in together, and that's a very good environment for a new virus to uh, emerge from a mutation. You know, if you look right here at home, we are doing the same kind of practices that could cause global health disasters. Most of the viruses that are on the CDC's watch list of viruses of special concern, most of them evolved on poultry farms. Are these practices and are these rituals and these habits that we have as a species, are they really worth it? You know, is it really worth risking our entire future and our children's future because of a steak or a chicken breast. And we're seeing this question being raised in the mainstream press in a way we haven't before. It soon became even worse for the meat industry, which became recognized as a global health liability. And in the US, was set to lose $20 billion due to COVID-19, according to a report by the Midwest Center. And as demand for animal products continued to plummet, the meat industry had to call on the US government's might for financial assistance. The administration declared slaughterhouses essential industries and slaughterhouse workers essential workers, when indeed it's the opposite. We wouldn't have a pandemic if we were a plant-based society. So instead of calling uh, slaughterhouses essential industries and the meat industry an essential industry, it is essential that we eliminate meat to prevent future pandemics. The people that buy cheap meat pay for it three times. Uh, the first time at the checkout, uh, the second through their, their taxes in subsidies to agriculture, uh, and the third is uh, through the cleanup cost to our health and to the environment, which is huge. But I think with COVID-19, that link between um, uh, the, the well-being of society and the way that we treat animals is now coming home to many more people. We've got to remember that protecting people means protecting animals too. Midway through the year, George Floyd's death led to the biggest Black Lives Matter protests the world had seen. Do what you say this country is supposed to be about the land of the free for all. It has not been free for black people and we are tired. What's his name? Awareness was sparked about dietary racism, 
highlighted most notably when the 2020 USDA dietary guidelines ignored alarming lactose intolerance data. 65% of the global population is lactose intolerant according to the National Institute of Health. This number is even higher among non-white populations, such as Asians, Blacks, and Hispanics, which you've all heard here today. Those who cannot effectively digest the lactose in cow's milk, they experience really painful symptoms. The newly updated recommendation stated that Americans should be consuming three glasses of dairy per day. This decision was heavily criticized. This is of particular concern for communities of lower socioeconomic means and is disproportionately affecting minority ethnic communities. The vast majority of people of color in this country are intolerant of the lactose that's in milk. Yet, because they think they have to eat this stuff, they go out, eat it, get sick, and think that they have some sort of intestinal problem. But in fact, when I encourage them to stop eating dairy, uh, they, their problems cleared up. Why on earth does the USDA have a food category on the dietary guidelines for Americans that makes over half of us sick, uncomfortable, and unable to breathe. For the USDA to continue to put its stamp of approval on a product that is unnecessary and unhealthy and rooted in a highly oppressive system is unconscionable. Not only did these recommendations ignore lactose intolerance in certain communities, there was growing evidence around the link between dairy and chronic disease. A review of 47 studies, for example, including over 1 million participants, showed that men who ate dairy products were up to 65% more likely to develop prostate cancer, whilst those on the plant-based diet were 36% less likely to develop it. Another study from 2020 showed that drinking one cup of dairy milk a day increases a woman's risk of breast cancer by 50%, with two to three cups increasing that risk by a staggering 80%. The recent research backs up the hundreds of other studies showing the link between dairy consumption and chronic disease, including cancer. It was shocking that in 2020, the USDA continued to promote dairy, especially in the face of other mainstream medical establishments, shifting away from recommending this food group, including Canada's food plate, which excluded dairy as an essential component after industry were prevented from influencing guidelines. And then the, it's actually the first time around this guide was based on science. All previous guides had invited the food industry to have seats at tables, to have votes at tables, and to have closed-door meetings. But the question in 2020 was why were other governments so slow to change their recommendations? It's not acceptable that the NHS is collapsing under the burden of chronic diseases, many of which can be prevented or treated by simple diet and lifestyle change. One of the reasons why the United States now has the highest number of deaths compared to any other country in the world is because of these pre-existing conditions. Let's think about them. Obesity, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, every single one of them cannot just be prevented and stopped, arrested in their tracks, but reversed with a healthy enough plant-based diet. So in 2020, we found out that not only does eating animal products increase the risk of chronic disease, but these same chronic diseases make you more likely to suffer a severe or even fatal outcome with COVID-19. Armed with this information, people were beginning to take their health into their own hands. One study from Italy at the end of June, for example, showed that a substantial number in the population were buying more organic produce in response to the pandemic and charity Viva commissioned billboards about slashing the risk of severe COVID by adopting a healthy vegan diet. Plant-based diet brings in what the body needs. It brings in fiber and vitamins, the right amount of protein, the right amount of nutrients, and it skips the thing that the bodies don't need. Cholesterol, animal fat, allergenic protein. It's lower in environmental toxins, so we're reducing our exposure to toxins and we're incorporating nutrients that are important to support our immune health. A plant-based diet is, is the most effective approach for improve or for reducing your risk for all chronic diseases. Whether those chronic diseases are things that happen to your brain like Alzheimer's disease, whether it's things like Hashimoto's hypothyroidism, whether it's things like fatty liver disease, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular disease, you name it. There isn't a single chronic disease that a plant-based diet can't improve. 
And if you really understand that and you really see the true power of a plant-based diet, then in my opinion, it becomes a no-brainer. And if you want to call it a silver bullet, call it a silver bullet because it is very, very effective. Italy has now lifted some of its toughest restrictions. It's across Europe, businesses are starting to reopen and children are heading back to school. As the world started to emerge from lockdown and over 10 million cases of coronavirus have been confirmed, another novel viral strain was identified. Chinese researchers have discovered a new strain of swine flu. It's called the G4 strain uh, of H1N1. You always have the possibility that you might have another swine flu type outbreak as we had in 2009. The new virus was named G4EA H1N1, a genetic variant of the H1N1 strain that caused the swine flu pandemic in 2009 that resulted in around 300,000 deaths. According to scientists, the G4 virus possessed all the essential hallmarks of being highly adapted to infect humans. So far, it doesn't appear to be very contagious and health authorities are quick to slow its spread. But it begs the question, with novel viruses becoming more frequent as we encroach on wildlife and expand factory farming, what if a viral outbreak emerged that was not only highly infectious, but with a high fatality rate, such as the Spanish flu of 1918, believed to have originated from the avian family, which killed upwards of 50 million people. The leading candidate, according to the CDC, of the next pandemic after COVID is a bird flu virus by the name of H7N9, mm. which is a hundred times deadlier than COVID-19. I think the long lasting lesson of 2020 has to be that we have a responsibility to act and change now. And um, we'll look back at 2020 and think that this was a dress rehearsal for much worse things to come. If the climate crisis gets worse, for example, the risk of pandemics are gonna continue to grow. We may look back and think that 2020 was just a warning and we should have taken it more seriously. People began to question whether animal farming was becoming too costly for our society, with a market analyst suggesting that the meat industry would face a troubling year ahead. This was underscored when the US beef industry was blasted for overuse of antibiotics in a new report by the Natural Resources Defense Council. Farm animals are fed antibiotics for their entire lives. This means that about 70% of all antibiotics produced globally, not given to sick humans, but given to well animals, to farm animals, in order to make them grow more quickly, and also to allow them to live through the conditions of industrial animal agriculture. What this means is that bacteria are figuring out how to get around the antibiotics. They're becoming superbugs, and when you get sick, the antibiotics don't work. The former president of the World Health Organization, Dr. Margaret Chan, she explained that the world is heading toward a post-antibiotic era in which common infections will once again kill. This will be the end of modern medicine as we know it. We're on the cusp of returning to a pre-antibiotic era where strep throat was a death sentence. Let me put it as basically as I can. If we keep producing food the way we do, you're going to get sick with something medicine cannot fix. 2020 represented the year that humans socially distanced to minimize the spread of disease. Yet animal agriculture continued to systematically enforce the opposite with 95% of UK meat produce coming from factory farms, 99% in the US. And in China, the latest case of bubonic plague in July was a reminder that diseases of the past are still a threat. From COVID-19 to a new type of swine flu, and now the bubonic plague, one of the deadliest diseases in human history has been reported in China. Some have pointed out that many outbreaks reported in 2020 started in Asia, which has become notorious for its animal cruelty and lack of animal welfare laws. And there was some truth to this, as wealth has increased. Demand for meat, particularly chicken and pork, has increased exponentially in Asia. Between 1968 and 2005, for example, the human population in China increased less than twofold, whereas the pig population increased almost a hundredfold, and the chicken population increased more than a thousandfold. While sobering, the sheer scale of consumption created opportunity, particularly for plant-based entrepreneurs looking to overhaul the system. One of these, David Young, revealed his plans to disrupt the pork business. 
by launching plant-based pork alternative Omnipork, which by midway through the year was starting to take hold in the region. As 2020's pandemic disruption sped up the shift towards plants, with people starting to pivot away from traditional protein sources over food safety fears, Omnipork's David Young struck again with new products, including vegan spam and pork shoulder. And he wasn't alone because food tech entrepreneur Josh Tetrick revealed that Chinese state-backed food companies were contacting him about protein alternatives. So for the good of the world and to the great economic benefit of the governments that seize this innovation opportunity, the time for governments to invest in remaking meat, that time is now. We've reached the point where there's so many livestock on the Earth's surface uh, that we're running into uh, challenges with keeping that system working. And that supply chain is now, as many in the industry themselves have said, is under enormous pressure. So I think we are reaching a tipping point. Beyond Meat itself was open about Asia being a key target. And the whole region became a battleground for plant-based meat makers, such as Impossible Foods, who've been expanding their distribution around the world. With 3D printed steaks launching and plant-based Wagyu beef even coming to the attention of MasterChef Hidekatu Toju, it was clear that meat alternatives were starting to mimic the taste and texture of the real thing. Even the biggest meat producers, the biggest killers of animals on this planet, uh, JBS, a Brazilian meat company, has a vegan product line. In addition to JBS, other huge meat companies like Tyson, Smithfield, Purdue and Hormel had all also rolled out meat alternatives. And despite the pandemic, media outlets branded 2020 the year that vegan fast food truly took hold. Now, more and more people are cutting out meat and dairy products and adopting a plant-based diet. I mean, we really are heading into a plant-based revolution. The world is changing. Uh, the demand for these products is simply too strong at the, at the customer level. We need to get products that taste the same or better and that cost the same or less. That's the holy grail. KFC's new vegan chicken burger. Singapore has given the world's first regulatory approval to sell its lab-grown chicken. The rise of plant-based meat and the development of plant-based meat technology is one of the most exciting prospects. It's the future of food, we know it. The meat industry over the last few years has attempted to halt the growth of the plant-based movement in various ways. But in 2020, the tactics became increasingly desperate. In August, the meat industry lobbied the European Union in an attempt to introduce a veggie burger ban. Tonight, why the European Parliament's Agricultural Committee wants to ban words like burger, sausage, cheese and yogurt to describe plant-based products. If the veggie burger ban was passed, plant-based producers would no longer be able to use words like burger and sausage to describe their products. They would instead be forced to come up with new names such as veggie discs or veggie tubes, apparently to minimize confusion in the marketplace. Introducing the veggie disc. Is it a frisbee? No. Is it a UFO? No. Is it a soup bowl? No. It is the genuine veggie disc, a nutritious and delicious food enjoyed by the whole family, including your dog. Ruff, ruff, especially me. Ideal for a picnic or a barbecue. Put it on the grill, not the jukebox. Don't be fooled by the genuine and authentic vegetable disc. Meanwhile, in North America, a uh, Crafty war was waged by the meat industry when Canadian meat giant Maple Leaf Foods entered the plant-based burger market through a subsidiary called Light Life. Light Life tactfully published an open letter to Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods through a full-page ad in the New York Times, criticizing the number of ingredients in their food. In a scathing rebuttal, Impossible Foods hit back, calling out Light Life, and by extension, meat giant Maple Leaf Foods, for running a disingenuous, desperate disinformation campaign. At the same time, the results from a study conducted by Stanford University showed that switching from animal protein to beyond meat actually had significant health benefits, including lower cholesterol and improved cardiovascular health risk factors. How did I introduce plant-based meat to my family, plant-based products to my family? Um, I just slid it on them, I snuck it in. You know, you gotta sneak it in, man, because so many people are accustomed to you know, a certain taste or a certain way of doing it. So you gotta slide it in and let it just be a, you know, a way of coming in. And it's like, mm, mm, what is that? Oh, that's something new. Mm. Well, how new? It's beyond me. It's actually plant-based. Oh, I didn't like. I didn't know I like plant-based. I know. Keep eating it. 
By the end of the summer, smash hit documentary The Game Changers started screening on Chinese video giant Yuko. The Netflix phenomenon had already opened up the debate on diet and performance since its release in 2019, with a number of athletes in 2020 ditching meat, including, but not limited to, Barcelona defender Samuel Antiti, who said he never felt so good since going vegan. You know, it's more than a performance reason for me. It's, it's um, a lifestyle, really. It's an a approach. It's something that I'm really proud of and, and uh, hopefully that community grows even more. It's changed my life, man. It's been, it's been one of the things I can honestly say that's just lately that has, you know, changed me from a mental standpoint, physical standpoint, and even a spiritual standpoint. But it wasn't just athletes who are curious. Well, my next guest, Anya, decided to adopt a vegan lifestyle and cut back on her favorite Dominican comfort foods, even though her family thought she was giving up her culture. My acne was really bad and I was just sick of trying everything and nothing worked. So I kind of went down the wormhole of, of documentaries and decided just to try this, this natural solution. You know, having watched Game Changers, having watched What the Health, it got us thinking, well, actually, what a brilliant opportunity. We're twins. You know, you watch all these, as Herc said, you watch all these documentaries on Netflix, particularly Game Changers, and it really does make you go, should we all be doing this? The Game Changers influence inspired the experiment so many of us have been desperate to see. What happens when one identical twin goes plant-based and one doesn't? Not surprisingly, plant-based Hugo's cholesterol went down and his energy went up. A vegan diet is very much more stable in terms of um, sugar delivery during the day, whereas a meat is, uh, you know, you get the ups and downs, which was really interesting. This was backed up by a 2020 study showing that a staggering 84% of type 2 diabetics normalise their blood glucose after following a personalised plant-based diet called the NFI protocol. But perhaps an even more interesting experiment was inadvertently conducted by James Blunt when he tried the complete opposite of a vegan diet a carnivore diet. I just lived on mince, some chicken, um, maybe with some mayonnaise, a little bit of, uh, you know, and, and it took me about eight, six to eight weeks to get very, very unhealthy, see a doctor who then said, I think you've got the symptoms of scurvy. <laughs> By the end of August, campaigns such as Plant Based Sneezes while Plant Milk Day went viral. And reports such as Dairy Does a Body Bad demonstrated that dairy is not just unnecessary, but also affects athletic performance. There's continuing like science from the health and performance aspects. And then of course, from the environmental aspects in the planet. And then with this lockdown, you know, we know that the, the root of this is from, from animals. I mean, you look at the swine flu, the bird flu, you know, all these pandemics, uh, three out of four, I believe it is. And then the funny thing is people say, oh, well, we don't want to spread disease. So we should um, separate and, um, you know, have this social distancing. Well, what are we doing to animals that are in, <laughs> you know, in, in factory farms? You know, what conditions are they in? So it's no wonder that disease is spreading, you know, uh, amongst those animals and then, it, and then it transfers over the human. So there's another reason um, for public health that we should be switching to more plants. People keep asking, you know, will, will life ever return to normal? Yeah, of course it will. I mean, it'll happen again. This will happen again. I mean, the wet markets are already opening in China and other parts of it, they're already, they're already getting back to it. You know, this comes from animals, like all the other things, like MERS and SARS, it comes from fucking eating things you shouldn't. And people still aren't taking it seriously. If everybody ate less meat or preferably no meat, that would, it wouldn't only reduce cruelty, but, but it would also have a huge impact, positive impact on the environment. September 2020 was recorded as the warmest month on record worldwide, and Arctic sea ice plummeted to its second lowest levels on record, scientists confirmed. Even though more and more people were becoming aware of the plant-based lifestyle, fires raged on like never before in California.
The recent data supported the severity of the climate crisis, with a new study showing that wildlife populations are in freefall all around the world. The research was one of the most comprehensive assessments of global biodiversity available and showed that on average, global populations of mammals, birds, fish, amphibians and reptiles plunged by 68% over the last 50 years. Over the course of my life, I've encountered some of the world's most remarkable species of animals. Only now do I realise just how lucky I've been. Many of these wonders seem set to disappear forever. We're facing a crisis, and one that has consequences for us all. It threatens our ability to feed ourselves, to control our climate. It even puts us at greater risk of pandemic diseases such as COVID-19. It's never been more important for us to understand the effects of biodiversity loss, of how it is that we ourselves are responsible for it. Only if we do that will we have any hope of averting disaster. In the same month David Attenborough's A Life on Our Planet was released, a new study confirmed what we knew before, that a plant-based diet was best for the environment. As the study authors put it, our results show that diets are the main determinant of greenhouse gas emissions, with highest greenhouse gas emissions found for scenarios including high meat demand, especially if focused on ruminant meat and milk, and lowest emissions for scenarios with vegan diets. What this piece of research showed and was backed up by with a 2018 piece of research that is considered the most comprehensive analysis ever conducted exploring the relationship between farming and the environment is that a plant-based diet is the most sustainable diet that we can choose as humans. And what's interesting about this study and also the 2018 piece of research as well is that they looked at grass-fed and free-range ruminant farming and concluded that even those styles of farming, the ones that we often see as being more sustainable, were also catastrophic catastrophic when it came to the impact they have on our environment. And overall, with all the food choices that we have, a plant-based diet is by far the most sustainable diet. A new report in October found that interest in eco-friendly products was up, with the vegan footwear market expected to surpass $24.8 billion by the end of 2020. This followed in the footsteps of other milestones in the fashion industry including most notably by Adidas, who launched three of its iconic styles using animal-free materials under its Our Icons Go Vegan line. In recent years, we have seen some changes on both the high street and within high-end designers when it comes to the kinds of materials that people are using. I'd say one of the major victories this year was when a number of high street and high-end fashion giants started ditching alpaca, and this appeared to be completely as a result of an investigation released by vegan charity PETA, which showed horrific animal suffering within the alpaca industry. So we've seen people like Valentino banning alpaca as well as people like the H&M group. There are other exotic skins which we've seen designers ditch, so kangaroo leather. We've seen Mulberry, very classic British high-end brand, saying it will get rid of all exotic skins. And of course, over recent years, we've seen more and more of these alternatives, for example, leather made from coffee grain or mushrooms or pineapple, and these are all becoming more accessible. By the end of October, the European Union rejected the veggie burger ban that the meat industry had previously lobbied for. Meanwhile, plant-based meat in the US was experiencing huge growth, up as high as 454% versus the same week in 2019. While in the UK, Oxford University removed meat in a bid to combat climate change. And in Israel, a pro-vegan TV ad went viral reaching 35% of the nation after being broadcast during one of the country's most popular TV shows. As winter set in, there was that feeling that society was back to square one. Cases are rising fast. 96,000 people a day in England are being infected. Across the continent, people are facing tougher restrictions in an effort to fight COVID-19. Germany is back in a partial coronavirus lockdown. Tell me the law that I have broken. 
by being here today. Tell me what law I have broken. You cannot tell me any law that I've broken. This morning, we may be one step closer to a vaccine. Drug maker Pfizer announcing its vaccine is showing to be 90% effective in trials. Closest comparison is the MMR vaccine, which took four years to develop, not under a year like what scientists are aiming for now. And even as uplifting news started to circulate about a potential vaccine breakthrough, there were concerning developments about the fur industry. Mink, often farmed in Europe for the fur, turned out to be highly susceptible to human infections, sparking fears that a mutation of COVID-19 could emerge from a mink farm that would undermine the COVID vaccine. Denmark has announced it will eliminate the country's entire population of farmed minks after mutated coronavirus strains were reported among the animals. More than 15 million will be culled. In some cases, the mutated virus also infected people. Medical experts fear that could jeopardize the effectiveness of future COVID vaccines. The mink cold is a stark reminder of the challenging road ahead. Even if the potential vaccine is successful, it may not be foolproof against future mutations. Unless we address the root cause, society would again be defenseless. We have some breaking news for you this morning because in the last few minutes we've heard that the first coronavirus vaccine has been approved for use in the UK. 2020 has been such a terrible year, hasn't it? And uh, help is on its way. The lasting lesson from 2020 has got to be how fragile existence is, how fragile this world is, how fragile life as we know it is. We are now seeing with wildfires, with drought, with a pandemic that we are now getting the gift of desperation. One crisis is colliding with another. It's hard to follow safer at home orders when you don't have a home. And as for all those living on the streets, survival is now more difficult than ever. 2020 has been a challenging year for so many of us. But it's because of this that ethics, health and sustainability have been pushed to the forefront of human consciousness. This declaration is an acknowledgement of the next generation, yeah, yeah. an acknowledgement of the burden that they will carry if we do not get this right and if we do not take action now. People are starting to join the dots between animal agriculture and the floods we see in the UK, Florida and Bangladesh and the raging bushfires in Australia and the more recent fires in California. So I think we've kind of moved beyond the old way of advocacy and we've started to look at the global implications of how the way we are exploiting animals could really be the end of humanity itself. If we continue to farm animals the way we're doing, if we continue with the wet markets, if we continue with factory farming, we are going to destroy this world and destroy ourselves. At what point do we say enough is enough? Because each month we see these viruses one step away from disaster. If an infectious disease from one of these factory farms or meat markets turns into a pandemic once every five, 10 or 20 years, at what point do we reconsider this industry? Can we afford the cost of a pandemic like this again? And if we can't, how can we justify continuing to eat animal products? It seemed to be a little bit of a taboo thing to say right at the beginning of the pandemic, but very quickly when mainstream media, like articles from The Guardian, from The Washington Post, and from Vox, when they started talking about these links, all of a sudden it normalized the idea of veganism being a way to reduce the risk of infectious zoonotic disease into the future. And so if there's one good thing that can come from coronavirus is that it could have been much worse. And the fact that it wasn't much worse has given us a chance now to change, to avoid something worse from happening in the future. Making peace with nature is the defining task of the 21st century. It must be the top, top priority for everyone, everywhere. More and more people were turning to the plant-based lifestyle, with 10% of Canadians now identifying as vegan or vegetarian. In addition, a survey from Germany revealed that the number of vegans there had doubled in the last four years. While upcoming vegan chefs landed major opportunities on TV, a vegan butcher store sold out in record time. Huge corporations began predicting and targeting massive rises in plant-based meat sales, including not just supermarket giant Tesco, but also multinational consumer goods company Unilever, who announced a 1 billion euro annual sales target for plant-based foods by the year 2027. While searches for vegan food near me skyrocketed by 2,100%.
2020 showed that the plant-based and vegan lifestyle was no longer a fringe movement. The question now is, what will 2021 bring? We all know climate change is real, but it's getting worse. Do you feel the eco-anxiety? We're a billion. Our mission? To inspire a billion people to go vegan. We're a growing community of people with a social purpose sharing tips about vegan food and sustainable products to create lasting impact. Imagine a social media platform where every post helps people around the world live more sustainably, influence businesses, and give back to impactful causes without a dollar from your pocket. We wanted to show businesses around the world that one out of every 25 dishes on their menu in plant-based isn't good enough. By creating a review platform, we create a lot of really interesting data points to chefs, to owners of businesses, showing them what people are saying about their vegan options to compete for your vegan dollar. Join the A Billion community and let's work together to help inspire a billion people to save our planet.